to people what? I talked to people at Riverside. I did. I talked to them and they and I, I suggested that there should be a slate. And we talked about what synced waves were. It was fascinating. And the guy I was talking to at Riverside Hall, his connection kept going in and out. So we barely got like five minutes of conversation. He said that he likes to he likes to he likes the connection, his Wi-Fi to be kind of substandard. So he hasn't improved it. So he can he can check. That's clever. Can, like trouble check. Yeah. But, but it I, did make but for ideally a he should have Yeah, ideally he yeah. should have I mean he should ideally he should have two connections, if not three connections. So if it's an administrative yes, conversation, he can yeah. switch back and forth. I mean yeah. that's okay. But you know what? It's a good app. It is it's a worked, good app. So we're, it's worked well for we're us. talking about the Riverside app, which is what we use to to record these podcasts, and it is really fantastic. And they're working on ways to uh, deal with low bandwidth. I mean, that's that seems to be their main their main issue right now. Is um, they try there's they're talking about different possible functionalities like like offloading the uploading of the of the wave file until at the end of the conversation, which is interesting. Well, that sparks. That sparks an idea in me, which I know absolutely I know almost nothing about. But since we're yeah. sort of winging this one, so yeah. that was a huge concern of the Bell Laboratories, um, Bell Labs, which ran the telephone, the, the only system. telephone, yeah. phone, the only phone system in America, the phone system, the yeah. phone system, Ma Bell, Bell Laboratories, um, spent an enormous amount of time researching the exact problem. And in fact, it was in re- in fact, it actually went back to telegraph and, um, and the research is into how to get as much information over a noisy or unreliable channel was of course, what led Claude Shannon in 19, 19- 54 or somewhere uh-huh. in the early 50s to write uh, a, a treatise called A Mathematical Theory of Information, which was hmm. the big... It, Claude Shannon is one of the, the greatest thinkers of the 20th century that nobody knows anything about. I've never heard of him. Yeah, Claude Shannon is the father of information theory. He's the guy. Wow. So what he, so what he basically did is in 1954, he wrote this paper, which was like the Cambrian explosion of the computer age. It was one of the key foundational theoretical pillars of digital communications, was uh, a mathematical theory of information. It's online. You can read it. It's actually very entertaining. He's a very interesting guy. Um, and he made, a vid- he made videos back in 1954 for Bell Labs. Very congenial. Wow. Love juggling. Love chess. Seems to have been like, <laughs> like a, 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 you know, a relatively undisturbed personality. Um, and what he basically s- and what he did is he laid down the mathematical foundations as to how much information can you reliably pump through a, a channel with noise on it. And he a worked twist out the and pair. Yeah. Well, any kind of channel. Or it oh. could be a satellite that's out beyond the orbit of Jupiter um, and right. has to transmit information back to you. So if you know how much noise there, and you know, it's the link power budget, it's like how much power do you have, blah, 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 blah. But basically, he wrote these equations that says, this is what you can get out of it. And everybody looked at those equations and said, you're out of your mind. There's no, oh. way we can, there's no way we can get that much information out of the circuits we're running today. And he said, yes, there is. And he showed him how to do it. And the problem is, is that it's, in t- it's computationally intense. And so right. nobody did anything with his... Well, I shouldn't say that. I, I hate using absolute language. Um, uh, cl- that Claude came up with many ideas. That paper spawned a million different things. It's, it's, it's a key pillar in encryption. It's a key, but it's hugely important wow. in what's called error, cor- error detection and correction um, coding, um, parity checks. Like, how do I know that what I sent got received on the other? How do I know that what right. I received is what the sender sent? And there's right. various schemes for doing that, such as parity check, or you just say everything three times, you know, or five right. times or six times. And <laughs> what Claude Shannon showed is that mathematically he proved that there's a way to send it that you can get this much out of this noisy channel. And everybody said, you're out of your mind. That's like magnitudes higher than 
anything we even imagined getting out of this. And he says, you can do it. And he was right. And what he had to do is he had hmm. to wait until the computational power came around the 1980s. And then right. 1980s, 1990s, people took his stuff and they started writing um, the stuff that I've studied a lot, which is low density parity check coding, which is LDPC, low density, which is right. in every single device we use today. It's in this phone that I'm talking over right now. It's used everywhere. It's used. It's actually mm. used an enormous amount in the incredibly short distance from the processor on your desktop computer to the memory chips, or from the processor on your desktop computer to the hard drive. But the key thing oh, you got to wow. make sure is that what you write to the hard drive is it, what you read back from the hard drive is going to be what you wrote to it. That's kind of an important you part of a hard drive. And yeah, so, it has to be exactly. Yeah. Right. So Claude Shannon. Um, and then LDPC came along, and they actually had the ability to computationally do this. And that's why we're talking on the phone right now. And that's why we can have full motion video over ridiculously... I mean, what we're doing right now would have seemed like complete and utter science fiction in 19... I mean, beyond right. science fiction. It would be like quantum entanglement to... Sir Isaac Newton. It would just it would be inconceivable. You're doing no, it's magic. You're doing magic. It's like, no, right. it's not. It's right. just a Claude Shannon showed he basically proved that you can get over there. That over there you can get it may take you a long time. We may not be able to get there today, but it's over there. And that's where you can that's go. That's amazing. Okay. So anyway, enough that's my my rant. Speaking uh, of which, I'm going to spin down my hard drives because uh, I just realized they're probably making noise. And you are in a new location. You're in a new home, and it sounds like you don't have your Wi-Fi set up, so you're talking through no. a different mic uh, over a cell phone channel. I have my Wi-Fi set up, but the problem is, is that uh, these headphones... It's a long story. Yeah. Nobody cares. I've got, I got plenty, my phone's communicating on Wi-Fi right now. I'm fine. But the whole microphone situation... What I did learn... Oh, this is going yeah. to be this is going to be this is going to be absolutely riveting to just, our, just our fans. Sheets drying in the wind. This is perfect. It's what we talk about. <laughs> anyway, so I bought these headphones, these Sennheisers. Yeah, Headf it's a headset, and I love it. It's great. I've always mm -hmm. wanted to. G I don't like earbuds; they fall out of my ears. And I want to be able to talk to people on the cell phone and be hands free. But I can't. The little things that hang off your ears, I never liked them. I'm really just a headset guy. So I got this headset. It's great. Yeah. It's got a USB C connection. I plugged it into my phone. Someday I'll play the recordings to you of what it sounded like. It sounded like somebody playing back an 8-bit sample into a 12-bit sampler with like a broken digital audio converter. It's like, <laughs> it's like complete digital hash. You can barely make yeah. out that it's like words, but I don't think you can really tell which <laughs> words they are. It just, it sounds like, it sounds like industrial music being shoved through uh, an, an emulator from 1987 or something like that. And when mm -hmm. I, and so I dug around and I dug around and I dug around. What I found is that all USB-C cables are not the same. Uh -huh. And that there's different kinds, and that the that the uh, Android phones, like the Pixel, which I'm using right now, uh, has a requires a four wire. Or it's like three wire versus four wire. Blah 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 blah. Yeah. And what I had to do is I had to buy a little adapter from Amazon, and now it works right. like a charm. But well, they're they're trying to standardize the uh, the European phone connections in Europe. Yeah, Power I think adapters. a law was passed. They did. Yeah, in the EU. Yep. Yeah, and that's um, that'll put a crimp in the in the old Apple. You got to buy a new adapter every five, four, uh, two years now. Yeah, I think like. I think the EU is kind of like I think the EU is sort of like had it with Apple. I mean, I think yeah. the EU is like sued them like twelve times, and I think they've just had it. Um, and yeah. they said they they said screw it. You're going USB-C whether you like it or not. Um, I think <laughs> I don't know. It's, I don't really know, but yeah. But it it only really affects Apple because the Android, right. all the other phone makers are using USB-C already. So the primary person that's going to hit is going to be Apple, um, and it's going to you know. And I think and, and there's a great. I read an article in the Economist about it. Economist is a good magazine, fun magazine to read. And mm -hmm. the guy basically said, you know what? He said the EU right now is really impressive. You know, we've done a huh. good job at standing up to the Ukraine uh, to Russia over the Ukraine, you know, we're right. we're managing Brexit, we're accept, you know, we're trying to manage refugees better than we have in the past. You know, we're really getting our 
we're getting, getting our stuff together. And then they go and right. do this about power adapters. He, the guy, the, the, I'll send you the article, but the guy was very, very funny. And he said, you know, it's great that they move with such decisiveness. It'd be great if they just move mm-hmm. with this decisiveness on issues that actually impact our that lives. That actually matter. That actually matter to us. And, you know, but, you know, yeah, you can, it's easy to say that, but um, uh, I think... You know, power adapters mean so. I mean, the, the 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 justification, the EU's justification was e waste. It generates way too much e waste to have right, two different that's power adapters. Yeah. And the guy goes, "Look, that's I've done thing. the math. The e waste is not certainly not significant to warrant <laughs> like uh, a regulation like this." But I think I think I think it's sort of part. I mean, the EU and Apple have been like pounding the crap out of each other for like twenty years now. And I think uh, mm. I think it's part and parcel of that. But yes. So anyway, um, so I got my Sennheiser and I got my little dingly cable, and I've moved into a new house. And thank nice. God we do not have video. Thank God this is an audio only podcast because if people could see me now, they would be horrified. Um, what, <laughs> what's going on in your world? Um, I just learned that the police are conducting active shooter drills around the Boston public schools. And that we should not be alarmed. <laughs> I, I, uh, alarmed about the alarmed about the drills, or just alarmed in j- the fact that we're having we, drills. We should not con- uh, we should not misconstrue this as meaning there's actually an active shooter anywhere. Yeah, this is the world we live in. It's uh, 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 as a parent, it's really that's really terrifying. But um, great, they're doing drills. That would be, that's okay. All right. Yeah, Everyone, that's... every parent got an email or got a got a text message. Don't be alarmed. I'm alarmed. I'm alarmed now. Yeah, I'm alarmed, <laughs> D- dude. We were alarmed long before we got this email. Yeah. Trust me. Yeah. And this is not gonna. This is gonna neither increase nor reduce my alarmedness at this point. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I just uh, I'm picturing something out of the Blues Brothers. Like, hut 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 hut. Um, but. Uh, yeah. Hey, look. I hope. Uh, I hope they're effective. These drills. School's almost out. Yeah. Yeah. I really don't want to comment on that thing, Uvaldi. Um, no, that's fine. It's, har- yeah, it's horrible. To- I know it, it's. It's so it's sad. In your it's state, but. well. E- even so, it's just so sad. Those. Th- you see the pictures of those boys and girls. It's just. No, it's awful. It's absolutely heartbreaking. It's so sad. Yeah. Um. And, you know, do you expect... <laughs> right. Right. I mean, I, I think we're... Look, we're in agreement yeah. on a lot of this stuff. I mean, I would say in terms of the... In terms of our police forces, if you're going to buy SWAT team equipment, then you'd better have a SWAT team. Right. And the SWAT team is a SWAT team because they go into dangerous places. When the danger comes, they go in. That's what a SWAT team does. If you're not going to do that, don't buy all the equipment at taxpayer expense. Because then it's just a toy. Right. That's, I mean, that's my feeling about it. So was that, so, was that what happened down there? In, I mean, I, yeah, Uvalde has a... You know, they were really proud of their whole SWAT team. And they... I don't know what happened. I don't, we'll, know, we'll know when the investigation's done what okay. actually happened. But. Yeah. But you know, okay, yeah, let's. This, yeah, this, yeah, this conversation yeah, yeah. is not going to win us any friends. <laughs> not going to solve this problem. This is. Uh, what else is going on? Catherine oh, so just texted me. She says, probably would be good if you let people know beforehand that there's going to be active shooter uh, <laughs> drills by the police force. <laughs> That might have that might have been a good idea. Just text all the people you just texted that it's happening right now. Yesterday, that that would have helped, right? Get ready. Don't be alarmed. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. So, so let's talk about something positive. Mistake. Okay, I'm writing a short story. Oh, okay. Yeah. What's it about? Sorry. Well, it, this is the positive part. It's about an eruption in Yellowstone National Park of the caldera there. Okay. And I don't know if you've read about that, but um, there's like a super there volcano, been, right, underneath. Yeah, it's a Yellowstone. super volcano. It's um, it's more powerful than the one that went off in Iceland by a lot, and um, 
whose name that I used, I had remembered it and I had memorized it, but now I can't remember it. Um, but uh, yeah, it'd be the biggest eruption in history, in, in, in recorded history, for sure. And uh, I'm, I'm working with a group of writers. We're all writing like journal entries from different points of view after, well, I'm, I'm starting before the eruption and then going to after the eruption. And it, it essentially throws, well, it throws enough ash into the air to, to cool the earth by about 10 degrees Celsius. Right. That's, um, and, and it also blocks the sun for, you know, a generation, probably poisons the soil for a generation. And, uh, of course, it's overdue. So, uh, so yeah, I'm writing, I'm writing a nice, a light little short story. <laughs> About a, a freshman in Oberlin College, uh, and her perspective on on the the Earth ending eruption yeah. in Yellowstone. It's just your guard variety upbeat apocalyptic yeah. end of society thing. Yeah, a lot okay. of fun to write. Um, yeah, yeah. The early part of the story is fun because they're just talking about you know how much she hates her roommate, and then all of a sudden. Boom. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> and wackiness ensues. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Laugh a minute. Laugh a minute. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> we are, um, uh, yeah, so there's a series of us. There's actually quite a few of us writing different, different stories about the same fictional event. Do you uh, like you know, it? The odds... I yeah you know I didn't I didn't know how I was going to approach it but I figured it out I figured it out yesterday at a Red Sox game um, I was talking with my friend John White who's the he's uh, the head of the biomedical engineering department at BU and I said so yeah have you heard about the Yellowstone caldera and possibility of he goes oh yeah that'd be really bad <laughs> <laughs> and we just talked you know while in between while the Red Sox lost gradually and horribly. Uh, we, we talked about it. Uh, to the Astros, by the way. Thank you. Um, and uh, they're what? They're like the, a, a they Texas team? They're like Houston, they right? They Houston? Aren't they yeah. Houston? I don't know. Okay. They were the other team when I was there. Um, but um, yeah, yeah. He, it, he, he, gave me a, he gave me some ideas, and then I, I got started, and I've written a good half of it. So. That'll be on an anthology out in the fall. You don't want to tip your hand about what some of his ideas... I don't want to say too much. I mean, well, I, I mean, what do I do? If big I could, point. If I, the oh, big plot point. Is just... I'm your friend. If, like, a super <laughs> volcano... Am I going to have to, like, beg you when the super volcano goes? What do I have to do? Do I, like, buy, like, a lot of Velveeta and go into the basement? I mean, what's... What? Do you, oh, yeah. Do you want to... Do you want to... I mean, it's not good. I mean... Well, we've established that. Yeah. Yeah, when that thing goes off, man, it's, um, and it's a question of when, but it's probably, you know, it could be tomorrow or 10,000 years from now. That's the thing. It's, uh, it's a little overdue by about 28,000 28, years. <laughs> okay, what kind of window are we talking about? Oh, you know, I wouldn't worry about it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Your bedside manner there's, sucks. There's no point. There's You've no got point this huge there's nothing tumor to do in about you. It. Well, what should yeah, I do? Ah, I, would, I wouldn't worry about it too you got, much. You got a gigantic 40-mile-wide um, tumor, and it's, uh, it's kind of on the left-hand side <laughs> center of the country, and we don't know. What should we but, do? Uh, I wouldn't worry know, about it. I would just... Um, don't put off any plans and you know, yeah. enjoy yourself. Be nice. Yeah. Life. Go ahead. <laughs> it's uh do you yeah. have a will though it i mean be, you might you might want to yeah. be dirty you know uh will may not do much probably no legal system after this oh yeah so yeah, uh, well, that, that yeah, buy work. a lot of canned goods and keep them somewhere and you'll last a little while it's like nuclear winter it's it's um yeah it's just it's just sitting there uh, okay so yeah, there's no rule. It's hard to make a happy ending out of this, so um, I'm, I'm working on it. Okay. I like to be positive. Well, 
be positive. Like somebody invents I, something. Well, uh, uh, let's see. Humanity uh, discovers um, a way to live without food. Yeah. Um, I don't, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of problems. Um, the, the, the ash cloud is the big, is the big. I mean, Idaho, Wyoming, Utah, goodbye. But, but everybody else, it's a lot of ash falling and then ash staying up in the air. And that's bad for crops. And then the ash is poisonous. So then it kind of falls into the Midwest and we can't grow corn and uh, electricity goes out everywhere. Not good. <laughs> <laughs> but other than that other than that a fun time is had by all <laughs> fun time okay <laughs> yeah so i moved into my house uh what have i what have i learned from this one well i have a lot of crap um uh, i gotta i gotta seriously throw away a lot of things and sell off a lot of things because yeah. you know i'm not getting any younger and uh moving is tedious at best um but lily's very excited um and it's a new house, and uh, I'm slowly putting stuff together. Um, I'm the proud new owner of a UDO Super 6 synthesizer. I Ooh. splurged. I bought a new synth. A UDO Super 6 synthesizer? Yes. The I name have of never the, heard of this model. The company's called UDO. They're from England, and the machine is called the Super 6. Um, and uh, it is not cheap. It is and not so, cheap. And what about, is it a digital synth or an analog synth? Or what is it? What is it um, I think the, it's, I, I'm not entirely sure, quite frankly. Um, and mm. that might strike you as surprising given the yeah. cost of the synthesizer. But I don't really care. Um, uh -huh. I've played analog synths. I've played digital synths. They both sound great. Um, yeah. <clears throat> what's more interesting about it is that my favorite synthesizer of all time, was the Korg Poly 6. Um, yeah. When you great. and I first met, probably I was probably playing a, a, a Sequential Circuits Prophet 5, which has become yes. iconic. An right, iconic right, right. synthesizer. If we had every, only held on to our old gear, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, was, I, I basically gave it away. I basically gave it to somebody. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, because it was yeah. like acting weird, and if you like banged it on the panel, it'd start working again. I was like, ah, I don't want to worry about fixing it. It's a piece of crap. Mm -hmm. So I basically gave it to this guy. <gasps> uh -huh. But but in all truth, I never really liked the sound of the Prophet Five. I didn't think it was really all that great a synth. Mm -hmm. It just didn't sound that great. Poly Six, on the other hand, completely grabbed me. I always loved the sound from the Poly Six, and the Poly Six has different filters. The the mm -hmm. the the Prophet 5 used the Curtis Electro Music chips, the CEMs. They're pretty famous. CEM, blah, 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 chips. And the, um, the, the org used the solid state microelectronics, the SSM chips. And, you're, and now everybody's yeah. like, everybody's heads They're are gone. Hitting. It's all Every, right. We're just talking the, for ourselves. All of our lists. Yeah, we're just talking for oh, ourselves at yeah. this point. But it's an, Said, it, let's talk about synthesizers. But it is interesting. But it, it, th <laughs> this is a topic that does touch on, on everything, I think. Because the interesting thing is that <clears throat> what, what makes... Let's talk about just the world of musical instruments. What mm -hmm. makes a musical instrument great? Well, I'll, be, I'll go out way out on a limb here and say it's due to two things. One, the sound. So it has to yeah. make a sound that you like. Uh, wait, did you knock your headphones loose or something? Because it sound you sound different. I do. Still okay, here now. You sound okay. I think you sound better. I don't know. It could just be the stream coming to me. Okay, maybe down. Oh, and I'm draining battery like a crazy man. But anyway, it should last oh, for there a little go. while longer. Um, <laughs> That'll be the end of the podcast. That's the end of the podcast. I'm, I'm at fifteen percent. It's dropping like a rock. But um, <laughs> you know, it's got to sound good. Yeah, it's got to sound yeah. good. And and. With many musical instruments, the second component doesn't matter, like guitars. You know, with an acoustic right. guitar, you know, if it sounds good, it is good. And if you like playing yeah. it, it is good. Um, because acoustic guitars roughly feel, you can tell me if I'm wrong, they roughly feel the same in your hand. 
you know, and they have frets and they have a neck board, but it's not like the yeah. guitar concept is redesigned every with each new model of guitar. With synths, absolutely it's com- not com- completely different. Each synth, yeah. not only are you changing the sound, you're changing the interface. So with synths, there's two components for something to work correctly. One, it's got to sound good, and two, the interface has got to work. Right. And the interesting thing about the UDO Super 6 versus pretty much every other synthesizer that has come out over the past 20 years, it has mm-hmm. no display. It is what oh. you see is what you get. It is there are some shift functions, but basically it's a control for every parameter. Is it, uh, are they knobs? Are they? It's knobs, are, sliders, uh, it's push knobs buttons. Knobs and sliders. There's a lot. I mean, you can look at a picture of it. It's, there are, there's plenty of it online. It's a lot of controls. And there's shift functions. Wow. So if you hold down shift and you turn a button, it controls something else. But there's no display. There's no menus. Hmm. There's no readouts. Hmm. And so it's like a lot like the Poly 6 or the Prophet yeah. 5. The Prophet 5 actually did have a two, had a, a, the Prophet 5 went a little crazy and had a two numeric display, mainly for displaying which patch you had chose. <laughs> did you choose patch 15 or patch 23? Uh-huh. Uh, the Cork Poly 6 had no display, and neither does the UDO Super 6. So the UDO Super 6 has no display. It's WYSIWYG. What you see is what you, or what you see is all there is. Um, yeah. So it's very tactile. And the other thing about it is that um, it uses, it, 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 it models the, the SSM chips that the Poly 6 did, which people probably say, oh, this is total nonsense. There's no difference between the CEM and the SSM chips. There is, and I can hear it in an instant. Um, it just sounds great. I just, uh, I mean, I just wow. got it, and I've been playing around with it. But it, it's an interesting thing to think about, which is um, interfaces. Um, mm-hmm. and, and all computer, you know this because you're a web designer yeah. and every computer does, you know, once upon a time, there was, there was no, there was no concept of UX or UI. Right. Didn't exist. Right. You just wrote yeah. the program and the UI or the UX was whatever you just happened to put together to support the code and the customers just had to buy it. And that's all there was to it. And nobody cared because there weren't many options. Right. It didn't really matter. Now. You know, in software, the UX team is perhaps more important than every other team put together because yeah. it has to be appealing to the end user and it has to work in a crowded competitive market where there's hundreds of different choices. Your user interface has to work. Um, and yep. so it's interesting. You see the same thing in synthesizers, which is that you have these magnificent, there's plenty of magnificent synthesizers with huge choices and displays that show hundreds and hundreds of menus. And uh, are you know? Do people yeah. gush over them like other machines? No, they don't. I mean, honestly, I I I could buy another Poly Six if I wanted to. I mean, they cost less than the UDO Super Six, but they're old, 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 <laughs> yeah. old, 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 old machines. They're going to break down all sure. the time. I'm totally interested in that. Um, now, my my favorite uh, synthesizer from back in the day was the Oberheim Expander, which um, did you? Which ever I still have. I still have it. You still have the Oberheim. I love the sound of that thing. It's 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 analog. It's it's full of like fuzzy and soft sounds, and yep. uh, it's all knobs. It's beautiful. It's, it's beautiful. reviled. It really has an incredibly bad name. It, the the Oberheim Does Expander. It? Yeah, we could have we could have an ignor- we could have five episodes about the Oberheim Expander. <laughs> but the Oberheim <laughs> Expander is 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 ridiculed. For many reasons. Hmm. One, that its fundamental sound pathway is really weak. And I tend to agree. Like, the fundamental Hmm. sound pathway is not great. And the interface is really cool, but it's it's not one knob per function. Certainly not that. I mean, we could go on and on and on. But the Oberheim Expander can do things that no other machine on this planet can do. that's it. And it it has... I mean, you can't get that sound otherwise. Right, and you can't get th- you you just you can't get all this you know for the people who want to play jump you know Van Halen's jump not going to yeah, happen on right. the Oberheim Expander right. for the nee, people who nee, nee. Yeah, yeah the people who want to you know there, there's like there's like twenty synth flicks that everybody You're wants so to play right. that is so an expander sound I'm just thinking about the beginning of that song now and that is one hundred percent an expander sound that's an amazing thing yeah well but there's a lot of th- Actually, the point I was making is that mm-hmm. it doesn't it it doesn't lend itself to like the classic sounds. It really doesn't. It no. doesn't because no. it doesn't have a unison switch. It doesn't have a glide button. 
And you can program Unison, you can program Glide, but it's a real pain in the ass. And so therefore, everybody who wants to do like their mini Moog solo, they want to be Keith Emerson on the Overham Expander. They're going to be <laughs> sorely disappointed. They're going to be sorely disappointed if they want to do, you know, if they want True. to do hardcore bass lines, and if they want to do this, and they want to do that. No, 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 no. But the Expander right. does a couple of things, and the Expander has been a hugely influential machine that pops up time and time again with synth designers like a lot like the guy who runs arturia mm -hmm. the primary designer for arturia who makes the the micro brute the mini brute the matrix brute the poly brute um the micro freak right right you know arturia very successful company the primary one of the primary guys for that company you could tell drank the kool-aid with the oberheim expander a lot of people huh. hark back to the oberheim expander as kind of uh, a key thing but that's interesting i mean uh, aside from the you know just to reassure our two listeners who are still with us at this point yeah, yeah. um it's, it's more than just about synthesizers it's about you know it's about creative things and there are some things that are created which are not hits with the general public but which have enormous impact on the people going to create other things i mean you know this jim there's some bands that never had commercial success, but every musician knows them. Sure. Every musician yeah. talks about blah, blah, blah. Um, and of course, I can't think of anybody right now, but I mean, there, there are people who are like musicians, musicians. Um, and same thing no, with I product, think of soul right? coughing. I mean, soul coughing had a yep. good deal of success, but, but, they're, exactly. but yes, musicians went bananas about them because they were doing stuff, especially in the synthesizer realm and the sampling realm that nobody else was doing and it was right. it was it was artistic and beautiful and you know you could sort of see how they evolved to try to become more popular to go more and more dance oriented but the really the art value of what they were doing was what caught the musicians and uh inspired a whole generation i think of, of people to make really interesting stuff that was bass heavy and weird it was awesome who else can you come with somebody else well yeah no then then i get stuck um Ugh. Well, I mean, I know a lot of musicians uh, locally that, that were influential, but... Um, Tom Waits. I mean, Tom Waits yeah, is not well, really yeah. a household name in America. When he got his Grammy, I think his speech was, thank you very much, this is very encouraging. <laughs> <laughs> and he was, you know, this was like recently. <laughs> yeah no but tom i think is one of those people that a lot of people looked at. Yeah. i mean there's there's because i don't think i mean other than the heart of saturday night i mean i don't think he ever i don't think he ever had like a, a major radio well he had ever. hit songs he had major hit songs he had downtown Himself? train yeah but did that actually yeah, like songs sorry so, songs yeah oh that got covered by others they got covered by rod stewart and uh, yeah, okay by all these other people yeah absolutely right yeah, um, but then, and then and then uh, and then Rain Dogs happened. And Rain Dogs then took him in a whole different direction, right? Um, which which was much harder to cover, and uh, but but really really inspiring. Wasn't Downtown Train off of Rain Dogs? No, is either Rain no, Dogs or Swordfish of Trombones? Swordfish Trombones, yeah, which is right right at that pivotal point before yeah. before Rain yeah. Dogs. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so there's Tom. Um, who else is there? I mean, well, I, I feel like Randy Newman has had a huge effect on people, but he's had he's had a lot of commercial success. But he's had a lot of commercial success. Um, I'm thinking uh, Wall of Voodoo. Um, mm, yeah. Uh, yeah. Oingo Boingo, which became Danny El which was Danny Elfman, who became a massive yeah, uh, film yeah. score person. Uh, I mean, I, we could go on and on forever and ever, but the interesting thing is that well, you have these things that are not... That were, weren't big commercial successes, but people get really upset. I mean, it happens with films all the time, cult films. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And people are quoting them all the time, yeah. Right. But they never really sold much at the time. Oh. So. And we've talked about Laurie Anderson being a gigantic influence on so many musicians, but you know, how many people actually like put on a Laurie Anderson album and listen to it all the way through? Well, you do. <laughs> yeah. I, I got to yeah. tell you, last night, I was watching Home of the Brave. Ah, which cool. when I first saw it, and when I saw it a second time, you know, what I've seen over the years, I'm like, yeah, okay. And then I watched it last. It's interesting how the world changes. And then I watched yeah. it last time. I'm like, this is really good. 
Like she's yeah. really she's really saying something I want to hear right now. Yeah. I'm not sure what it is, but there's there's things that's, that are now that's always not sure. <laughs> well, there's this great thing like, where it's it's um it's Adrian Bellew on the guitar, and it's mm -hmm. oh a, yeah a guy on the sax, and it's mm -hmm. her, and it's just them. It's just a trio of them, and I think David Van Tegem is playing percussion off stage. Yes. But the focus yes. is One just of the on the greatest those percussionists ever. Yeah, yeah, Amazing. he's great. He's fabulous, and he's oh. playing. He's you know, and he's playing the Simmons drums, and he's playing like these kind of very dated samples. So that's why it's not. You know, that's why it's not stellar, but he is all, I mean, you realize he's playing all this stuff live and then you realize he's really working. Like this is yeah. not, yeah. this is not trivial, but there's this particular one, I forget what it's called, but it's, it's just instrumental and it's just Adrian Bellew and the sax player and some percussion and her, and it's fabulous. It was just from really the air, from the air. Uh, no, it's not. It's uh, from the air. Is the one. This is your captain speaking. Oh, oh, okay. That's from the air. Oh, yeah. I'm thinking of a different one. Yeah, I'm not going to get the title right. No, it's beautiful. Um, I'll send you a link to it. Um, it's all mm -hmm. up on YouTube, of course, like everything else on our planet. Um, but like, I I rewatched um, "Stop Making Sense," the Talking Heads thing, mm -hmm. and that left me completely cold. Like. 20 really? minutes into really? it. Yeah, 20 minutes into it, I was like, I'm done with this. This is not saying oh, anything interesting. at all to me. Whereas wow, that blew Laurie my mind Anderson, back in the day. Uh, yeah, yeah, it did mine too. When I first when yeah. I first saw it, I thought it was great. I thought it was riveting. Um, and I didn't think Home of the Brave was all that terribly good. And now it's like completely reversed. Now it's like Home of the Brave wow. is talking to me a lot more now than uh, that and a lot of other things. And I think, and also Laurie is a enjoyed sort of a resurgence i've seen her in the new york times and various things like that a lot of people are talking right, right. to her and talking about her um but um yeah you know, i played oh superman for my daughter i said you gotta you gotta listen to this i mean this is a pivotal this is a this is a, a foundational tune um you gotta you gotta hear this one at least um so what, I played her what that. did she think i think she thought what a lot of other people think is like okay <laughs> I gotta go do my homework. <laughs> it's really, I mean, I mean, it's really to to me. What I hear when I hear "Oh Superman" is I hear the influence of Philip Glass. I hear a lot of Philip Glass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if and and from so, the air too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And if and you're bringing, I'm I'm bringing a lot of baggage when I listen to that tune. I, I know the sampler, I know the vocoder, I know the exact keyboard that she's using, I know that she's doing vocoding, I know about the nuclear war and how it was about nuclear war. I mean, if you don't yeah. understand that stuff, it's just this crazy one going, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, and you're like, okay, I get it. She's <laughs> She hit a button on a sampler that repeats herself. And it's like, it mm -hmm. sounds totally stupid. It just sounds like some maniac just riffing on top of one note. Yeah. And so it and it is. Right. It is unless you have unless you have that background to it. And so that opens up a really fascinating question that really I'm fascinated by. I'm sorry, Jim. I'm just rattling now. But like we often talk about, you know, accessibility. Right. You know, how accessible is something? And 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 the usual complaint is, oh, that picture of modern abstract expressionism you know it, it means nothing unless you un, unless you have like a bachelor's degree in fine arts and mm -hmm. you know all the otherwise it's just a glob of paint right on a canvas and i'm like okay you may have a point there but where do you stop in that analysis i mean at that right. point what's great and what's not Okay, so let's take a, an engraving by Albrecht Durer. Mm -hmm. You know, his famous engraving of, like, the rabbit. I don't know if you've ever seen that right. one. Right, sure. Yeah, Yeah, the rabbit. Is that amazing? Mm -hmm. How would you mm -hmm. know? Is it accessible? It's accessible to somebody who knows what a rabbit is. Right. Because if you don't know right. what a rabbit is, <laughs> it's going to look pretty odd. Um, and so... I always get a little worried when people say, oh, well, the great thing about Beethoven is that you don't need, you know, it's so much better than, say, you know, uh, 20th century abstract music because it's much more accessible. And I'm like, yeah. Eh. 
okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, it is. Well, but the whole point is accessible because you and I share, you know, there's certain things that we share. And there's certain things we can understand that as soon as we hear Beethoven, you know, Beethoven's baked into the DNA of Western music. Yeah. So every time you listen it's, to it's a, a pop cultural tune, vocabulary we have, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's baked in there in everything. So it's not going to come across like you're listening to, like, you know, the monkey chant from Indonesia, which actually is quite accessible and quite lovely. But it's not, <laughs> you know, it, but the whole point, the, the thing is that there's, I don't think there's anything that's universally accessible. Or maybe if there is, it's a mother's voice singing a lullaby. You know, I mean, I mean, this is a much deeper conversation than I'm, I'm doing justice to it. But um, you know, part of me says, "Well, is is Oh Superman by Lauren Anderson just junk?" <laughs> and so, so it'd be very interesting to see what happens when the aliens finally get the Voyager satellite and play that golden record. I'd like to see That's what they right. think, because they will have no context. Is Downtown Train on that, on that record? No. Yeah, twice. No. There's, there's the... <laughs> twice. And then the remix by Africa Babata. Um, yes. I, I, I remember one guy wrote this article said, these are the tunes that we should have put on the golden record. And one of them was, yeah, 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 yeah. He says, <laughs> it's important to make clear to the aliens that it wasn't just good looks that got us up from the lungfish. We, we can take care of ourselves. Thank you very much. <laughs> and he wanted to do happy birthday to you. He says, come on, isn't that like a natural? I mean, the passage of time and stuff like that. Uh, these yeah, are, it's so tricky, though, man. Oh, uh, yeah. I don't know. You're you representing humanity, are you? Are you really? Are you just representing your neighborhood? Well, frankly, how like, can you not? How yeah. can you not? I mean, that's part of my point, is that it'd be interesting to see what the aliens think when they, dro when they drop the needle on that record and they hear... There's a Bach piece on that. I know that for a fact. There's a Bach. There's right. several Bach pieces, I think. Yeah. And um, they drop the needle on Bach. Now, if you if you find unanimous agreement among amongst people about anything, it's that you know Bach is the greatest classical composer, widely agreed, or uh, mm -hmm. definitely up there in like the top five, um, and that Bach is some of the most universal, most perfect music there is. Hmm. Okay. okay. All right. Okay. Well, I guess we could have. I'm sure people played Bach to other cultures that had never participated in the Western musical tradition. I'd be interested to see what they said when they were playing well, Bach. I mean, it's a problem, though. If the aliens speak in music, then we might find out that Bach was just writing in an alien language all of these insults about their mother. Right. And uh, it will just be nothing but just one harangue after another on that record. I guess my point is, point is that view. when you enjoy music... When you love music, when you care enough about music to tell other people about it, to spend your money on it, to even endeavor to perhaps recreate it by taking lessons and de devoting a career to recreating it, mm -hmm. is it what's compelling you? What is the beauty in it? Is it truly within the music, or how much of it is everything around the music? It's like, okay, it's Bach. And Bach had 14 children, or I forget, he had a lot of children, um, mm -hmm. so he's interesting, and he wrote this, he wrote the St. Matthew Passion, he wrote the St. John Passion, he the wrote all The story we passions. tell about the music. And then okay. there's the story, and then it's the Passions, and he wrote the story of the St. Matthew Passion, the St. Matthew Passion is beautiful, and the St. John Passion has this chiastic structure where the intervals invert themselves from the beginning to da 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 blah 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 which is all, I'm not saying it's meaningless, but the whole point is... Is our enjoyment purely the music? What does that mean? What does that mean? It's like it's like sometimes you get un unhappy that people like grab the album, they start reading the words. I'm like, why are you reading the lyrics? That has nothing to do with the music. Why are you reading the lyrics? Mm. You're, you're, mm. And, and people like, you're the weirdo. Why why <laughs> why aren't you reading the lyrics? The lyrics are the most important part of the music. And then well, there's for some people, right? It's poetry. And then, and then there's the look, you know. Mm -hmm. Oh, they—it's got a motorcycle, and he's wearing a leather jacket, so he's a rebel. Right. Okay, that's fine. <clears throat> or you know, he's singing my tune. He's singing about the things that I care about. So he's got a cowboy hat on. Right. Yeah. Or yeah. 
or he's got dreadlocks and be, whatever yeah. you know it's whatever and so it's this it's is my kind of music yeah this is right. my kind of this is the music that i like and why do you like it and and so i i find that fascinating about um the context how important is context and can you ever escape context and is there music that is inherently um interesting in and of itself and again you know i'm sure it's been done i'm sure they i'm sure i'm sure uh you know i know that gamelon music was played to westerners um to great effect um mm -hmm. wc and others were absolutely obsessed with the gamelon music that played at the i forget it was either the world's fair the international exposition in paris in like 1900 it's probably earlier or like 1876 huh. or 1879 which was the 100th anniversary 1889 which would be the 100th anniversary of the french revolution whatever there is something there is there is some exposition there was a in thing paris. there was place. a thing in paris in the late 1800s and there was gamelon there and they invited the gamelon people to come there and supposedly wc went back every day like every oh. possible performance he could go while they were showing while they were on tour he went back there each and every time he was he was obsessed by it um but that's an interesting question is he slotting it into his context i'm sorry right. this is getting way far field yeah let's yeah okay <laughs> what are you reading I'm reading the contract, the U-Haul contract. That's what. <laughs> that's 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 your literature right now. What did I read? I I read Silver by I read the I think I told you last time like the Uprooted Lady. Oh yes, that's right. Uh, uh, Naomi Novik. Novik. Naomi Novik. I wrote. I read Silver. Different kind of book. A little more adult. Yeah. A little more serious. Still interesting. Liked it. Um, mm -hmm. I read that. Mm -hmm. Have I read anything else? Have I read anything else significant recently? The U-Haul contract could be a good story, though. It's sort of, you know, a big chapter on why we're not responsible for all the crap we break of yours. Is that, uh, is that I did, I'm, I'm joking. I didn't read anything. I just gave them <laughs> right. money, and they gave me a truck. Oh, no, I, you I, actually, you moved it yourself. You didn't have people move it for you. Oh, yeah, no, no. I, I, I just Hence rented the, the U truck. Hence the U and U-Haul. Yeah. 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 Or you, as it was once known, U-Haul it was the original name of the company. Yeah, and then they dropped the right. ed. That was a major cultural change. That was big. We're gonna, that was... we're gonna drop the. Ed. It's like we're gonna drop. It, it was used. It used to be known as micro hyphen soft. Well, here in Boston, they've dropped the donuts from Duncan. It's just called Duncan, and if you've really? got them in Texas, they're called Duncan now. And it's called KFC. Find... It's, an older, it's an older called and Kentucky called Fried KFC. Chicken. Because right. fried is bad for you. And I guess donuts are bad for you. Newsflash. <laughs> so they dropped it. <laughs> um, and yeah, I don't know. I look at that sign and I think, Duncan. It just sounds a little dirty to me. It sounds Scottish. It's like, wasn't Duncan? It's like, <laughs> Duncan. Macbeth. Uh, McLeod. <laughs> Duncan the Highlander, the Highlander, the Highlander. We're in the Highlands. <laughs> <laughs> Duncan, Duncan. There can be only one, and there's like a million of them within two blocks here in in Boston. I one time researched because there was no dunks down in uh, Texas, and I said, "Hey, they, mm -hmm. they need a dunks down here." And I was actually See, right. See, dunks would be better, I think. Yeah, because dunks actually dunks. have expand have ex has expanded enormously recently in Texas. Mm -hmm. But back then, this was what. Uh, 2009 2010 and i i researched i said how much does it cost to start a dunks franchise you need five hundred thousand dollars in cash and you hmm. need a net personal worth of at least a million dollars uh-huh i was like okay <laughs> not today all I'll, right i'll start okay. a, i'll start a subway instead i think subway had slightly less demanding criteria for becoming a franchisee um, but yeah, it was, it was a serious, it was a serious commitment to start at Dunks. Yeah. Yeah. So, huh. but they're taking off in, they're now taking off in Texas. What was there before? I mean, what was the donut plate in te place in Texas that was not most really, I mean, was Texas, te Texas is sort of like the Galapagos Islands. It does have sort of its own biome. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. It really is like a separate place because you, the, there, there are virtually no rival supermarkets at all in texas it's all h-e-b 
Oh, okay. Like, there's no Acme, oh. there's no a and P. I don't know if these even exist anymore, there's no Kroger's, there's no Aldi, none of that. There's no Super Fresh, no Super Trader Fish. Joe's, or... There's Trader Whole Joe's. It must be Whole Foods. Yeah. There's Whole Foods, Trader Joe's, and Central... Oh, there's, Whole, there's Whole Foods and Trader Joe's. Um, yeah. But, but in terms of, like, the main supermarket chains, yeah. zero. None. And it's all H E B, which is a fairly well run thing. For bre- for for um fast food, there yeah. is the cult of Whataburger. Uh-huh. That's and that's a, big, a Texas did it start there? Huge. It's a huge Texas yeah. thing. I mean, most Texans, about eighty percent of the atoms in their body come from Whataburger, I'm guessing. I mean I <laughs> I, my boss every morning had the orange and white striped bag on his desk. And I said so you get like a breakfast sandwich at Whataburger. Yeah, oh yeah. They, it's they, not it's, just a lunch thing. Yeah. No, 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 no. It's 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 like McDonald's. It's the full shebang. Um, and every morning he every morning people have the orange and white bags on their desk. And I I went up to him. I said, you know, eighty percent of the atoms in your body are from Whataburger. <laughs> Whataburger. Um, I I haven't tried any of like any of the new chains like uh, burger chains like uh, Eight Guys, In and um, Out, Two Two Grills, and a you know <laughs> open fire. I don't. I don't. <laughs> Just uh, <laughs> they all sound like they all sound like Gerard Depardieu movies, but, <laughs> but with <laughs> the naked man and the grill. Oh, I'm losing you. I may have lost Lionel. Oh, he's coming back. The naked man. No. And we may have an abrupt end, an abrupt end to this very strange episode of Funny Not Funny. <laughs> Funny Not Funny is produced by me, Jim Infantino. Music by Jim's Big Ego. The solo you just heard by Steve Sadler. Our website is funnynotfunny.bigego.com. We are found in most places you can find podcasts. If you like this podcast, please leave a star rating or review. Thank you.